Good afternoon, everybody. I apologize for the delay in getting started. Uh, Mr. Carney, I'm sorry? Oh, good. good. I want to keep you in the rhythm here. Uh, Mr. Carney is taking his son to camp today, so uh, I'll, I'll be minding the store. Uh, so, Julie, I'll ring you up first. Thank you. Uh, a couple questions on the mini peace talks that are starting in Washington tonight. Uh, we know that the president apparently is going to be meeting with Secretary Kerry later today to discuss those talks, but does he have any plans to meet with the Israeli and Palestinian negotiators while they're in town? Uh, Julie, I don't have any uh, details about the president's schedule over the next couple of days to read out to you. Uh, there's no current plan uh, for that, but um, I wouldn't preclude uh, anything from getting added in the future. Uh, as you know, uh, the Middle East peace process is something that, uh, or at least these conversations that are ongoing or that are slated for this evening, uh, w was a part of a process that was kicked off by the President's trip to the Middle East earlier this year. Many of you uh, traveled there for that visit. Uh, and the President had the opportunity to visit with Prime Minister Netanyahu, President Abbas, uh, and King Hussein of Jordan, where they had some conversations about how it's in the best interests of both the Israeli and Palestinian people to engage in uh, final status negotiations. Uh, since that time, Secretary Kerry has been traveling frequently to the region. I think every couple of weeks, uh, it seems like he's taken a trip out there to, to talk to the parties and to talk to uh, others in the region who have a, an important stake uh, in this conflict being resolved. So we're certainly encouraged uh, that the two parties are coming to Washington and beginning their conversations this evening. But we're also cognizant of the hard work that remains over the next nine months. There are some very serious uh, issues that have to be resolved, and it's not going to be easy. Uh, but the um, journey of a 1,000 miles begins with the first step, and we'll take that first step tonight. Now that this first round of talks is underway, how does the President see his direct role? Is this something where he's going to still continue to sort of cede the front runner status for the U.S. to Secretary Kerry and maybe only get involved if these talks continue and get to a, a real final status moment? Mm -hmm. Well, I'll say a couple things about that. You know, the first is, you know, this is a process that got kick-started with the President's trip to the Middle East earlier this year. And at the President's direction, Secretary Kerry has been traveling frequently to the region to engage with the leaders of both sides and the leaders of countries in the region to talk about this process. So there has been robust involvement um, from the United States. There is a role for the United States to play in terms of encouraging both sides to come to the table, trying to facilitate conversations, and in some cases even conjoling uh, one side or the other to, to try to move the process forward. That's something that Secretary Kerry has been engaged uh, in for quite some time now uh, and has taken up a lot of his time over the last several months. Uh, Ambassador Indyke is also going to play a role uh, in this process now moving forward, as was announced earlier today. Uh, and the President will, um, will continue to uh, be briefed, as he has been. Uh, as you see on the President's schedule, he meets on a, about a weekly basis with Secretary Kerry. In each of those meetings, the Secretary has kept the President uh, closely apprised uh, of the details uh, of these conversations. But that's, so. what, that's what we should expect at this point, the President basically hearing from Kerry and, and others involved in this process, but not at this point getting directly involved in negotiations himself. Well, I wouldn't uh, get ahead. I mean, the, the negotiations haven't even started yet. So uh, I wouldn't necessarily uh, make that assumption. I mean, as this process moves forward, uh, the President and his administration will stay engaged. I guess the point that I would also want to make here is that it is ultimately up to the two parties uh, to reach a lot of these determinations. Again, there's a role for the United States to play in terms of encouraging and facilitating and cajoling. But ultimately, when it comes down to making decisions, it's going to be the responsibility of the negotiators on both sides to, to, strike, that to strike an agreement or to, uh, or to at least reach uh, a resolution. Is there anything you can tell us about the lunch that the President had or is mm -hmm. having with um, mm -hmm. the Secretary of State Hillary Clinton today? Um, somehow I knew somebody was going to ask about that today. The, uh, the President is having lunch this afternoon with, uh, with Secretary uh, Clinton in the private dining room right off the Oval Office. Uh, as you know, over the course of the last four years, and as much has been written about uh, over the last four years, how Secretary Clinton and the President have developed not just a strong working relationship, but also a genuine friendship. Uh, and so it's, uh, it's largely friendship that's on the agenda for the lunch today. So it's not a working lunch as much as it is an opportunity for the two uh, who saw each other on a pretty frequent basis over the course of the last four years to get a chance to catch up. Now, whose idea was it? Uh, the President invited Secretary Clinton over for lunch. So, Josh, yes, Mark. Um, back to the Middle East uh, talks for a second. There's substantial turmoil in the Middle East. 
Syria, now in Egypt. Where does the president see these talks on the Middle East fitting into that dynamic of the region? Why is that important? How would that contribute to an easing of tensions? Or is it unrelated? Mm -hmm. Well, I think many people who have closely examined this process over the years uh, have acknowledged how the conflict between the Israelis and Palestinians has led to some destabilization uh, in the region. And there certainly is the strong potential that uh, a, a good outcome of these kinds of, of these conversations could have an impact on the, on the broader region in terms of lowering some tensions um, and promoting a little bit more stability. But I wouldn't want to, I, I don't want to front run the outcome of this process. There is a long road ahead uh, that both sides will have to come to the negotiating table, which is hard enough getting them to the negotiating table, actually making the kinds of decisions, the difficult decisions that will be on the table at those conversations uh, will be even more difficult. So I don't want to front run that process, but certainly there is uh, a strong benefit to finally confronting so much of the tension that has fed a lot of turmoil uh, between these two parties. And with regard to Egypt, does the United States have any misgivings about providing assistance, financial or otherwise, to a military that appears to be responsible for the deaths of so many people involved in protests? Mm -hmm. Well, I can tell you that uh, we have been watching closely the, the events in Egypt. We, um, the United States strongly condemns the bloodshed and violence in Cairo and Alexandria over the weekend that claimed the lives of scores of Egyptian demonstrators and injured more than 1,000 people. Uh, our sympathies are with the families of those who lost their lives as well as those who were injured. Uh, it's the view of the United States that Egyptian authorities have a moral and legal obligation to respect the right of peaceful assembly and freedom of expression. And violence not only further sets back the process of reconciliation and democratization in Egypt, but it will negatively impact regional stability. Uh, at, you probably saw the readouts over the weekend from Secretary Kerry and Secretary Hagel. Both of them spoke to their counterparts in Egypt to convey our concern uh, about the violence and bloodshed that we saw. The leaders of the interim government of Egypt have promised the Egyptian people and the rest of the world that they are committed to reinstituting a democratically elected government in Egypt and doing so through an inclusive process. The violence that we saw there certainly is not indicative of that commitment. Uh, this president and this administration and our allies and partners around the world are committed to making sure that we hold the Egyptian government up to those promises. And in fact, the UN high, I'm sorry, the EU high representative for foreign affairs, uh, Catherine Ashton, is in Egypt right now. And she's engaged in a dialogue with the Egyptian government and a range of other parties in Egypt uh, about ending this bloodshed and speeding the democratic transition uh, in Egypt that uh, we hope will take place quickly. Does this most recent bloodshed put U.S. assistance uh, in any jeopardy as far as Egyptians are concerned? Does it take us closer, perhaps, to withdrawing that assistance? Well, I don't have any uh, change in our posture to report to you today. Uh, the, our assistance to Egypt is something that is reviewed on a regular basis. And many of you reported at the end of last week about the uh, transfer of uh, some F-16s being delayed. So uh, I don't have any new, um, new information to convey to you about our, our assistance other than to remind you that that's something that is regularly reviewed over here uh, at the White House and at the Obama administration. Let me just jump to a different topic. Sure. The uh, president gave an interview over the weekend in which he made some comments about the Keystone XL pipeline. He did. He said he didn't think it would necessarily create that many jobs on a long-lasting basis. <coughs> Why, if he questions the usefulness of that pipeline, either from an economic or uh, in terms of its damage uh, environmentally, potentially, doesn't he just say no to it? Why drag this out? Well, because what the President is committed to is making sure that there is a merit-based process in place to evaluate whether or not the construction of this pipeline is in the interest of the United States of America. There is a process for making that decision, for, that, for making that determination, and that rests over at the State Department. And that's what they're engaged in now. Now, there are a range of estimates uh, out there about the economic impact of the pipeline, about how this pipeline would have an impact on our energy security. Um, there are also estimates about how uh, 
this pipeline uh, may or may not contribute to um, some environmental factors. So there are a range of analyses and studies that have been generated by both sides of this debate. What the President is interested in doing is draining politics out of this debate and evaluating this project on the merits. And that's exactly the process that's underway at the State Department right now. Okay. Jessica? How optimistic is the President on the peace talks that this first round of discussions here in Washington will lead to concrete, positive negotiations in the Middle East? Mm -hmm. uh, the question that you're asking is entirely legitimate, but given the fact that the negotiations haven't even started yet, I don't want to predict the outcome. Uh, I will tell you that it's obviously a good sign that both sides are sitting down. Uh, it's been several years since that's happened. Uh, Secretary Kerry, after, at the direction of the President, has been hard at work in trying to facilitate these conversations. So we're pleased to see that that process has moved a little bit, at least. But we do so with the full knowledge that there's a lot of difficult work ahead, that there are very difficult decisions that both sides are going to have to confront. And ultimately, these are not decisions that will be made by the President or anybody in the United States of America. These are decisions that are going to have to be made by the leaders of the Palestinian people and by the leaders of the nation of Israel. Secretary Kerry, the current Secretary of State, arrived at the White House just after Secretary Clinton, hmm. your former Secretary Are of State, Are you watching arrived. the parking lot back then? I was. <laughs> uh, any chance uh, the two of them will meet uh, while the, she's lunching with the President, and will this be a topic of discussion? Uh, it's my understanding that the table is, uh, is being set for two, uh, just for the President and Secretary Clinton. I don't know if they bumped into each other in the hallway or not, but... Uh, it's my understanding that these are two separate meetings. And is the peace talks uh, uh, one of the topics on the agenda for their lunch? For the lunch between the President and Secretary yeah. Clinton? Um, the, the, the purpose of the lunch was chiefly social, but given that the President and Secretary Clinton worked on this pretty closely together over the course of the last four years, I'd be surprised if it didn't come up. Can you give us a little more background on the lunch? How long has this been <coughs> in the works? And if I can be so silly, what do they plan to eat? Knowing of your intense interest, <laughs> I've come prepared to answer your question. The White House chef today whipped up some grilled chicken, some pasta jambalaya, and some salad for them to enjoy during lunch. I haven't had lunch myself, so that sounds pretty good. Um, <laughs> uh, I don't know what's at the mess today, actually. Um, I don't anticipate that we're going to have a detailed readout of their lunch because it's chiefly a social occasion. Uh, but we are working with the photo office to see if we can provide a photo that I imagine many of you will be interested scheduled? in. Uh, I don't know. I don't think it's been scheduled for too long. Um, but it certainly is. Uh, the President wanted to take advantage of the opportunity for the two of them to catch up, and that's what they're doing. Do they communicate periodically by phone and whatnot? Do uh, I don't have any other conversations uh, between them to read out to you. So I want to jump around a little bit. Is there anybody in the back that has a Josh. question? Jared? Yeah, Josh. Uh, has the President referred to any current or previous member of the cabinet or the vice president as someone who would be good for the top job for his job in the future? Uh, not that I'm aware of. And I, tw 2016, despite the intense media interest, is something that is still quite a ways away. When we're talking about the uh, Israel-Palestine negotiations, uh, I didn't hear anything in your statement about the, the release of, of prisoners by Israel. In your statement at the top, is there a White House reaction to that? Mm -hmm. Yes, there is. Let me... Uh, let me read it to you. Stand by for one second. Uh, the administration welcomes the Israeli cabinet vote yesterday and sees it as a positive step forward in this process. Prime Minister Netanyahu has publicly said that he thinks it is very important to enter the diplomatic process and that there are moments like this where he needs to make tough decisions for the good of the country. So the United States welcomes the leadership on his part uh, and his interest in making the difficult and courageous decisions that will move this process forward. Okay. Kristen. Josh, thanks. Can you give us a bit of a preview of the President's meeting this afternoon with civil rights leaders uh, and local elected officials that are going to discuss the Voting Rights Act? What does mm -hmm. the President hope will come out of this meeting, and who specifically will be there? Well, we'll have a full list of the people who attended the meeting uh, after the meeting has concluded. Uh, the President is uh, interested in having a conversation uh, about the Voting Rights Act. We've articulated already, and I think the President himself has articulated his deep disappointment uh, in the Supreme Court decision uh, just a month or two ago. Um, I'd remind you that in 2006, uh, the Voting Rights Act was reauthorized, so this is only seven years ago now, that the voting rights was reauthorized with the unanimous support of the United States Senate and with the near-unanimous support of the House of Representatives.
And then that legislation was signed into law by President George W. Bush. So it is uh, our view that this is that the protection, the, the protection of the constitutional rights of Americans and the protection of the voting rights of those Americans who are eligible to cast a ballot should be protected, and we should be able to build bipartisan consensus about the need to protect those important rights. So that'll be some of what the president is going to talk about today with um, both some civil rights leaders, but also some state and local elected officials. And uh, as I said, I think we'll have a list uh, of those who participated in the meeting after the meeting concludes. And do we expect him to stay in contact with them moving forward in the coming weeks and months? Well, this is certainly an issue that the, that the president cares about. Uh, it is something, the Attorney General will participate in the meeting. This is something that the, the Attorney General has, has vowed to uh, keep a close eye on. It's obviously his responsibility as the Attorney General to ensure that, these, that the voting rights of those Americans who are eligible to cast a ballot are protected. Uh, that, is a, uh, that is a priority of the Attorney General. It's the priority of this administration. So I would anticipate that there would be future conversations along these lines. And I want to ask you about uh, something that uh, Treasury Secretary Jack Lew said this weekend. He said the President wouldn't sign a government funding bill that cut domestic spending. So I'm wondering, heading into these budget battles in the fall, is the President prepared to shut down the government over this issue? Well, what I can tell you is that the, the President's been traveling across the country. He traveled to uh, both Illinois and Missouri on Wednesday, and he traveled to Florida on Thursday, and then he's obviously headed to Tennessee on Tuesday. Uh, and in the remarks where he's giving in each of those locales, he's talking about his view that when we're making economic policy decisions in Washington, D.C., we need to put the interests of middle class families front and center. The reason for that is not just because that's probably pretty good politics, I think it probably is. It also makes a whole lot of sense in terms of policy making. It's the, uh, the President famously said this in the State of the Union address, that he believes that the foremost challenge facing this country is how to reignite the engine of our economic growth. And that engine of our economic growth is the middle class in this country. So if we can make the kinds of investments that will expand economic opportunity for the middle class, then we can get a growing and thriving economic recovery. Uh, and that's, that, that should be everybody's priority. And so we welcome the opportunity to work with Democrats and Republicans on Capitol Hill to make progress along that. I assume that Democrats and Republicans share that priority, that they view getting our economy moving and strengthening our recovery and expanding economic opportunity for the middle class should be our top priority. So if they share that priority with the President, then we shouldn't have any trouble being able to roll up our sleeves, sit down at the table, and work out an agreement to get that done. Well, if you can't get an agreement if Republicans are only offering spending bills, uh, bills that cut domestic spending, is the President prepared to go to the brink over that? If you listen to some of his rhetoric, both in his interview with the New York Times and again with Treasury Secretary Jack Lew was saying this weekend on the Sunday shows, it seems like they're gearing up for a fight. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the, again, if we are going to put the middle class at the, at the center of our economic policy decision making, then we would understand that a, more self-inflicted wounds from Washington, D.C. are not going to strengthen our economic recovery. So a government shutdown or a showdown over the debt limit that's not going to be in the best interest of our economy. We saw in 2011 the terrible impact that that would have on our economy. It would have a terrible impact on certainty. Um, and that is something that we want to, we want to avoid. Um, fortunately, I have good news to report. There are some senators who have also spoken out and said that this would be something that they think we should avoid. Republicans, both in the House and the Senate, think that shutting down the government is a bad idea. So we should be able to come, come together around, uh, around a bipartisan solution that will protect the critical investments for the middle class, things like making sure that we're keeping a college education open to middle class students, that we are guaranteeing that young children ages three and four have access to a high quality uh, early childhood education program, that we can allow responsible homeowners to benefit from a strong housing market, that we can ensure that middle class families in this country have the opportunity to retire with some dignity and with some measure of financial stability. That these are the cornerstones to a middle class life, uh, and we can do all of that while continuing to make progress in reducing the deficit. I mean, it's, has been, as has been discussed, the deficit's actually been cut in half since the President took office. So we've made some progress on the deficit. We can continue to make that progress at the same time that we're making the kinds of investments that the President thinks is critical to the country's future, not just in the short term, but over the long term as well. Let's go back to the back. April. Josh. I'm Josh. I'm going to uh, follow back up on issues of voting rights. Um, the President met with the Congressional Black Caucus and also uh, last month uh, 
some of the Democratic senators said, and this is prior to the uh, Supreme Court's decision on voter rights, they said that they were working on matters to create a possible fix. Has the President been in contact with the Democratic senators about this possible fix when it comes to voting rights and also um, and been in touch with the CDC again in reference to voting rights? I don't have any specific conversations uh, to read out to you from the President or his staff, but suffice it to say this is a priority of the President's. It's something that the President uh, worked on even before he entered public life. Uh, and, you know, I also pointed out, you know, a really interesting fact that this morning I wasn't aware of, but that in 2006, uh, this is something that was, had the unanimous support that reauthorizing the Voting Rights Act, that putting in place protections to ensure that individuals who are eligible to cast a vote uh, are able to do so. Protecting those rights is, is paramount to our democracy. And the President is certainly interested in working with Democrats and Republicans to protect those rights. Uh, and you know, that's something that Republicans have supported in the past, and I don't see why they wouldn't support that kind of, those kinds of measures in the future. Language was so tight um, from the Supreme Court. What kind of ways can you get around the provisions that were struck down? I mean, mm -hmm. what is the President thinking? Well, I'm not an attorney, so I'm not sure I can provide a legal route for uh, ensuring that these rights are protected. But I think it's, uh, it's fair to say that there is a demonstrated bipartisan agreement that those rights should be protected. And uh, it's not a matter as, uh, uh, of going around the Supreme Court as much as it is working with Congress to make sure that those rights that are enshrined in our Constitution and are defended by the Supreme Court uh, are protected. And that there is a, there are some communities uh, in this country where those rights have historically been at risk. And ensuring that there are protections in place to protect those rights is, uh, is something that uh, has attracted bipartisan support before and uh, deserves uh, bipartisan support in the future. Okay. Jim. Let me go back to you just for a second. Uh, the administration has been uh, expressing its uh, concern and its uh, even mild outrage about what's been going on in Egypt as far as the killing of, uh, of their citizens. But what should the American public know about when the administration, when the president feels it's time to, to do more than that? For the tr what is the trigger? When is it enough is enough that military aid or foreign aid, both tools that the President has, should be used? Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, there should be no confusion about the President's view of what happened in Egypt over the weekend. Uh, you know, I've made very clear, and you saw some statements over the weekend from se various senior administration officials indicating uh, that we condemn the violence and the bloodshed that took place over the weekend there that that is inconsistent with the commitment that's already been articulated by the interim government to an inclusive process uh, of government that leads to uh, democratic representation and democratic governance uh, of Egypt. Uh, that perspective was also conveyed directly by Secretary Kerry to his counterpart in Egypt. That perspective was also conveyed directly from Secretary Hagel to General al-Sisi in Egypt. And that is part of the message that uh, Lady Ashton is carrying with her in Egypt uh, on this very day. So our, our views of what's happened there over the course of the last 72 hours or so uh, have been made abundantly clear. So then the question becomes, what do we do? How do we engage with not just the Egyptian government, but with all relevant parties in Egypt to steer them back toward an inclusive process that leads to a democratic government? And those are, those are the kinds of conversations that this administration is having with uh, our counterparts in Egypt. Those are the kinds of conversations that we're having with other partners in the region that have some leverage over the situation. And this is one, also one of the reasons that we are on a regular basis reevaluating the assistance that we provide to Egypt. And that's uh, part of an ongoing process. But is, so there's no particular trigger, no red line as there was before in, in Syria? Is there anything here that the, that the President just will not stomach? before he starts pulling aid. Mm -hmm. Well, wh what we want to see, and what we have told the Egyptians that we would like to see, is a prompt return to democratic governance through, a, through an inclusive process. Uh, now, that means several things. That means um, you know, engaging in a dialogue with all parties. And we can't engage with, uh, in a dialogue with all the parties if some of those parties are uh, currently being uh, detained. So we've called for the the, the release of all those who've been detained for political purposes. Uh, it's going to require Egyptian authorities to respect the rights uh, of Egyptian citizens, including the freedom of expression and the right of the 
the right to a peaceful assembly, uh, that these are all civil rights, uh, basic civil rights, uh, that democratic governments respect around the world. And we uh, will hold the interim Egyptian government and the Egyptian authorities that are currently in power for, uh, accountable for protecting those rights. And then the next snapping curve, if I could go over to politics sure. for a moment. Okay. As um, the president and the leader of the Democratic Party, does he have an opinion on whether or not Anthony Weiner should stay or go as far as the race is concerned there? Not you know, one that I've heard. <laughs> Major. <clears throat> I want to get you to say something I think you're saying, but you haven't said directly. The administration believes the Egyptian military is principally responsible for bloodshed in the streets in Egypt. Yes or no? Well, what we have said is we, we condemn in uh, no uncertain terms the violence and bloodshed that we but saw. who's most responsible for it? Well, what the Muslim well, Brotherhood is unequivocal about who's responsible for mm -hmm. this. They're being killed in the street by the military that ousted the democratically elected president. Mm -hmm. Does the White House agree? Well, one of the things that we have said is that we are supportive of an independent inquiry uh, into the actions that occurred over the weekend. But that kind of violence and bloodshed that we've seen is unacceptable. Uh, and it is why we are, it, it is what prompted phone calls from Secretary Kerry to his counterpart. It's what prompted phone calls from Secretary Hagel to General Al-Sisi to, to make sure that there is no ambiguity associated with is our view. Here in this White House that by not declaring this a coup and not suspending aid, that the military interpreted that as a green light to carry forward with some of its confrontation with the Muslim Brotherhood that has resulted in this violence? Uh, of course not. And the reason for that is simple. We have been very clear uh, with the Egyptian authorities about the need to make good on their promise, to uh, put together an inclusive process that will send us back, send that country back to a democratically elected government, and a government that reflects the will of the people, that reflects basic civil rights, like the, like the freedom of expression and the right to a peaceful assembly. These are basic rights that should be protected by a democratically elected government. And there is nothing that, uh, that is ambiguous about that statement, and nothing we've done that is inconsistent with that desire. Uh, Kenneth Bai is an American citizen being held in North Korea. There are some reports that former President Jimmy Carter is considering a trip there. Would the White House encourage or discourage that kind of diplomacy? Uh, I'd refer to the State Department. I've seen those reports. I can tell you that uh, President Carter is traveling to North Korea uh, on a private trip. He's doing that in his personal capacity. But in terms of what conversations, uh, in terms of what conversations we've had with President Carter, I'd refer you to the State Department. Okay. Uh, the President, in his New York Times interview, said he is reviewing several extraordinary candidates for the Federal Reserve Chairmanship. Is Janet Yellen among them? Uh, I'm not prepared at this point to uh, open up the playbook in terms of our, uh, of the process, of the process that's underway uh, for filling that very important job. Is there anything that you could say in addition to the President's current emphasis on the middle class and the Federal Reserve's interaction with the economy that might help us understand how he's evaluating these extraordinary candidates. Mm -hmm. The President did talk about that a little bit in, in, in his interview, and I don't think I'm in a position to expand on that One at this point. One last thing before I let you go. I know this is a bit in the weeds, but in 2009, when the President first took this office, he delayed the creation of a new Marine One helicopter for his transport. <coughs> Thursday is the deadline for submission of bids for a new helicopter mm -hmm. that the Navy has put together. I'm not going to ask you who's going to win or anything like that, but it appears that the process has been drafted so tightly that there may only be one applicant and the cost may actually be higher, con contradicting both of the President's stated goals for delaying in the first place. Do you know anything about whether he's disappointed with this process or thinks this is just something that is inevitable in government contracting? And is he going to take the new helicopter? Well, I think the thing that he would say if you were standing here is that he would say, well, let's wait till the, the window closes on this bidding process before we start evaluating how, how well the bidding process worked. So uh, for details about that bidding process, I'd refer you to the Navy that's conducting uh, this exercise. Uh, but you know, certainly the goals that you've articulated and that the President himself has articulated uh, in terms of doing this in a cost-effective way uh, and, and, in, and in a way that continues to protect the safety of uh, the future Presidents who would fly on that aircraft, um, th th those goals remain in place. But in terms of getting to those goals, I'd refer you to the Navy about the process. Well, on Friday, if there's only one bidder, you can be, we can be sure you'll be <laughs> giving us all the disappointment from the President about this problem. Well, if I'm standing here on Friday, then you can ask. <laughs> all right, let's go to the back. Leslie. Uh, Josh, are you familiar at all, or is the White House familiar with a report out of New Zealand that U.S. intelligence agencies were helping its military track the telephone calls of a, a 
colleague, a Mufachi journalist uh, working in Afghanistan at the time? Mm -hmm. I'm actually not aware. I've, I've seen those, like the headlines in those reports, but I'm not aware of the story. Uh, I would encourage you to either check with the State Department or maybe even the director of uh, the Office of the Director of National Intelligence. Is the White House, you know, at all concerned that that raises some questions of if the U.S. intelligence agencies are helping foreign governments track phone calls that could be used to get metadata of U.S. reporters as well? Right. Well, it, it's hard for me to express that concern without having read the report. So um, if you want to touch base later after I've had a chance to take a look at it, then maybe we can talk. But um, my, my colleagues at the Office of the Director of National Intelligence should be able to help you with that story. Okay. Ed? Josh, on uh, government shutdown talk, um, one of the things that um, <coughs> was reported on Friday was the Washington Post saying that the President might be taking a harder line in these negotiations and so wants to do away with the sequester that he might be willing to veto a bill to keep the government open. Is he so determined to do away with the sequester that he'd be willing to shut the government down? Well, we've uh, been pretty clear about our view that the sequester is bad policy. That's why it was put in in, uh, in the Budget Control Act in the first place is because it is bad policy. And there are plenty of Republicans who tell you the same thing. Uh, so the question does become, you know, what do you do to turn off the sequester, right? Now, the President's put forward a budget uh, where he laid out a very specific plan about how we could turn off the sequester while protecting the critical investments uh, that are so important to expanding economic opportunity for the middle class, while at the same time actually doing more to reduce the deficit than the sequester itself. So we've laid out our plan for how to do that. Uh, what the President's most focused on right now, though, is his commitment to ensuring that we maintain the progress we've made in helping our economy recover. We're digging out of the worst economic downturn since the Great Depression, and we've made a lot of progress. Over the course of the last 40 consecutive months, the private sector in this country have cre has created 7.2 million jobs. We've got an uh, a domestic auto industry that was on the brink of collapse that's now coming back. We've got a housing market that has um, that is recovering very nicely. So we've made a lot of progress. The question now is, what are we going to do to maintain that progress? And the President believes that we can maintain that progress by making these, these investments that are so critical to the middle class, while at the same time staying on the, tra the trajectory that we're on to, uh, that has allowed us to cut the deficit uh, in half over the course of the last five years. A pretty grim message from Jack Lewis, as Kristen mentioned, about you know how the debt ceiling fight, government shutdown fight, could really hurt economic growth. Mm -hmm. And you get all these looming budget battles, and yet the president is about to go away for a week. Congress is going away far longer than he is. They take basically most of the month of August off. Is, is any thought being given inside the White House to calling Congress back into session? If this is a, as desperate a situation as Jack Lew suggested, why is Washington basically going away for the summer? Well, the prospect of a the prospect of a government shutdown or more drama around the debt ceiling is, would be bad for the economy. There's no doubt about that. Uh, and I think, again, that is a view that is shared by uh, leaders in Congress in both parties. So there is ample time for us, based on that general agreement, there is ample time for us to make sure that that doesn't happen. We don't need any more self-inflicted wounds. We saw the damage that that could uh, have inflict on the economy back in 2011. Uh, and so we can avoid that uh, again. It's just a matter of sitting down, uh, rolling up the sleeves, and figuring out what we can do to preserve these investments that are so critical to the middle class. And we can do that without threatening a government shutdown. And we can do that without any drama or delay in making sure that uh, Congress uh, protects the full faith and credit of the United States of America and pays the bills that they've already incurred. Two other quick things. Uh, New York Times has a story today saying one way that Detroit hopes to get out of debt deal with the bankruptcy situation uh, is to take some of their retirees who maybe in the early 60s not ready and eligible for Medicare and take them out of city paid health care mm -hmm. uh, and put them into the insurance exchanges that will come in with the president's health care law. My question is how worried is the White House that Detroit, other cities in trouble, may take some of the health care costs that they don't want to deal with and push them in the exchanges in a way that actually makes it more complicated to implement the law mm -hmm. and, and dump some of the cost on the federal government? Well, I've, I've seen the report. I have not heard uh, a, a, a close analysis of this. Uh, this is certainly something that, um, that we're taking a look at. Uh, I mean, I, I, the one thing I will say, though, is this, is that one of the benefits of the Affordable Care Act is making sure that those Americans that don't get health insurance through their employer are able for the first time to go on the open market through these marketplaces and purchase high-quality, affordable health insurance. Uh, 
Uh, that is, they can comparison shop, uh, and they can choose the program, the health insurance program, that is best for them and their family. That is something that didn't exist before. So, uh, so I, I don't know how this will shake out or what relationship that has to uh, cities that are contemplating a policy option like this. Uh, but it's something that at the White House that we're taking a look at. Last thing, when you ta talking about the president's economic tour coming back tomorrow, and you say the focus is on the middle class. Pew had a study back in April about the recovery from 2009 to now, and it was saying that basically under the president's policies, the rich have gotten richer. The middle class has seen income shrinking, as the president himself says out there. The study also said that the rich got even richer in the Bush years, by the way. Um, but the point being, how do you go out and make the case and say that this tour is about helping the middle class uh, when, in fact, the middle class has seen the rich get richer over the last four years? Well, I think because of the, the studies that you're citing there, that's actually what's motivating the president's speech. I, um, oh, you know, or the, or the comments that the president's made over the last few days. The president is concerned about the studies like the ones that you cited there, uh, that as we've gone through the recovery, we need to make sure that those benefits are flowing to the middle class. Um, if they don't, if those benefits flow just to the top 1%, what we're, we're going to do is we're going to get back into that boom and bust cycle that actually led to the worst economic downturn since the Great Depression in the first place. So the President wants to make sure that we can put in place a policy regime that will protect investments. Uh, that are so important to people in the middle class. So again, this is everything from making sure that a college education is open and accessible and affordable to middle class families, that every child in this country has access to a high quality early childhood education program, that, that middle class families can, can retire with some measure of dignity and financial stability, that uh, responsible homeowners can take advantage of a strong and recovering housing market, that these are the cornerstones of a middle class life. Uh, and those are the kinds of investments that the President would like to see, and those are the kinds of investments that are required to make sure that the benefits of this recovery uh, are enjoyed by the middle class. Because if they don't, if we don't make those kinds of investments, we're going to see the benefits flow just to the top 1 percent, and we're going to en end up in the same boom and bust cycle that led us uh, to the worst economic downturn in the first place. Yes. Okay. Roger? Uh, <clears throat> back to the Fed for a moment. Um, about a third of the Senate Democratic Caucus wrote to the President late last week, when you're familiar with the letter, I assume, uh, recommending Yellen. Uh, one, can you release that letter? And second, how does a letter such as that affect the President's selection process? Uh, as I recall from the reports, that, that was a letter that was being circulated and had been signed by some members. I don't know that it's actually been sent to us. I haven't seen it if it has. Um, but my guess is, well, based on my experience uh, working with my colleagues on Capitol Hill, that if you ask them to release the letter, I'm sure that there are dozens of people who'd be happy to do so. Uh, How about so, the selection process? Well, as I, as I told Major, I, your interest in this is certainly understandable, and I think that there are a lot of people across the country who are interested in this process. But I, I don't want to weigh in at this point to try to, uh, even with the best of intentions and my desire to try to steer you in the right direction, I'm concerned that my um, carefully scrutinized words might cause some to overinterpret uh, what I would say and lead you to the wrong conclusion. That's the opposite of what I'm trying to accomplish here. So uh, the President talked about this a little bit with the New York Times. Uh, the, the transcript of that interview was published in the New York Times on Sunday. That should give you some pretty good insight into how the President uh, is approaching this decision that needs to be made. It would be fair to say that he'll give the recommendation some weight, would it not? Uh, which, oh, the, the letter. letter. We're back to the letter again. Uh, um, I mean, he doesn't ignore it, right? Well, look, he's the President of the United States, and the, the Chairman of the Federal Reserve is an appointee of the President of the United States. So uh, I think ignore might be too strong of a word, but I think the President has, I think the President has the, uh, well, sure, but that's their advice and consent role, right? So they have a role in this process, but the President's role is to appoint someone. It's the Senate's role in this process to evaluate those appointees. So we'll go through that process. I think the President uh, has made clear in that interview that this is something he's been thinking about for some time, and I think he has his own pretty uh, strongly held ideas about what he'd like to see there. Okay. Ann? Thank you very much, Josh. You mentioned that uh, 2016 is pretty far off, but do you think at some point the President will want to express his choice of who might be uh, the best Democrat to uh, run for President? <laughs> I would and, and was Vice President Biden in front of the lunch today? Well, as you know, Ann, uh, the Vice President has lunch with the President on a weekly basis. Uh, so I don't know if uh, he was joining the lunch. As I mentioned to you before, I think the table was set for two. Um, <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> um, 
but I would I would anticipate that the president will continue to have lunch on a weekly basis with the uh, with the vice president. Uh, in terms of whether or not he'll weigh in in 2016, I think it's far too early to tell. I'm sure there'll be plenty of people, probably even you, who will ask him about that. Uh, but I, I'm not going to commit him one way or the other at this point. And how will he measure the impact of these economic speeches, such as the one he'll give tomorrow? Mm -hmm. uh, is there some kind of feedback by which the White House figures, yes, these are working, or no, they're not? Mm -hmm. That is a, uh, that's a good question. Uh, I think the goal of these speeches is to try to recenter the debate. That for so long we spent a lot of time focused on, um, <coughs> focused on debts and deficits and getting that under control. And as I pointed out, we've made tremendous progress here uh, in terms of cutting that deficit in half over the course of the last five years. So uh, what the President wants to do is to redouble his efforts to put the interests of middle class families back at the center of that debate. Certainly middle class families have something to gain from the progress we've made in terms of reducing the deficit. But there's a lot more that we can do to help middle class families, and that's what the President's focused on right now. So how do you decide whether or not these, this series of speeches is working? Mm -hmm. Well, I think what we'll do is we'll evaluate the, the debate in the weeks and months ahead. Uh, and I, I would concede that that is a rather nebulous criteria. But I think it's important nonetheless for the American people to understand what the President's policymaking priority is. Uh, it certainly is important for Congress to understand what the President's priorities are. Uh, and I th again, I, I think that there uh, are certainly Democrats and maybe even some Republicans who share the President's view that we should put middle class families front and center of this debate. Uh, that's what the President's committed to doing and hopefully we'll have a debate that reflects those priorities. So, Josh. David. Uh, Josh, uh, later today, a few minutes maybe, I think the White House is coming out with a report on immigration talking about the positive economic benefits. But the House looks like they're going to break this week without taking any significant action on reform. And I'm wondering if you could tell us how the White House and the President in particular will use the congressional recess to press the case. Will he go out and talk about it publicly and how so? Well, I, uh, there is a report that's slated for release later this afternoon. Uh, and I, I understand that the Secretary of Agriculture, Tom Vilsack, will be talking about the findings of that report. So I don't want to get out ahead of what, what announcements he may be uh, making, but I certainly commend uh, to all of you that, that report that has some important conclusions about the economic impact and the economic benefits, I should say, of comprehensive immigration reform, including in smaller communities all across the country. Uh, in terms of the President's activities over August, uh, his calendar is still coming together for that month. Uh, unlike Congress, the President will be at work for most of that month. Uh, and I would anticipate that you'll hear him talking about the importance of uh, finally uh, making some progress on comprehensive immigration reform. The President himself has said that we have a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to finally fix a broken immigration system. And uh, we've made significant progress by working in bipartisan fashion in the Senate to build strong bipartisan support for that legislation. There's now also strong support all across the country in faith communities and law enforcement communities among business leaders and leaders in organized labor for that compromise piece of legislation. So we would anticipate that uh, that momentum will continue to build for that piece of legislation. And we'll see. To the point where it's behind schedule, that especially with the, the debt ceiling and other things and the budget coming up uh, in September being such an important part of uh, the focus, uh, is immigration just going to be pushed back further? Uh, I won't deny that we would be perfectly happy for uh, the House of Representatives to pass that bipartisan legislation uh, today uh, and have a signing ceremony at the end of the week. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't anticipate that's going to happen. Um, but I, I do think that there's pretty strong momentum built up behind this piece of legislation, that we really have built uh, a strong coalition. Uh, of people that often aren't getting together on pieces of legislation. When you see both the business community and the labor community strongly supporting a piece of legislation, you know that something uh, pretty interesting is happening. Uh, when you see the uh, evangelical community uh, weighing in strongly on a piece of legislation that the President's eager to sign, that's uh, sometimes a pretty good indication that there's something unusual going on. So there's some strong support for this, not just in Washington and not just in both parties in Washington, but among communities all across the country. Uh, and I think that momentum is only building. Uh, and we'll see how uh, House Republicans uh, respond to that pressure. Can I follow yeah. up immigration? All right. Can you talk about why Chattanooga tomorrow and what in that speech will be different from the three previous speeches? Mm -hmm. What the President's going to be focused on tomorrow in Chattanooga uh, are policies that we can put in place that will support the private sector as they create jobs and continue to lead this recovery. There are important, the President alluded to this a little bit in his remarks in Jacksonville where he talked about how infrastructure improvements uh, and efforts to modernize the port in Jacksonville uh, have led to some job creation and expanded economic activity, uh, not just in Jacksonville, but in the region. Uh, 
So there is a role for the government to play in supporting the private sector as they continue to create jobs and lead this recovery back from the worst recession since the Great Depression. So the President will be speaking at an uh, Amazon fulfillment center in Chattanooga. Uh, and I read in the, in the newspaper today that uh, Amazon has committed to hiring another 5,000 workers at those fulfillment, fulfillment centers located all across the country. Uh, that's the kind of investment that we're starting to see more of, that if we can put in place policies that will encourage companies to invest in America, to bring back jobs from overseas, uh, that if we can invest in the kind of infrastructure uh, that's required to uh, allow companies to get products to market more quickly or to their customers more quickly, that's certainly something that we want to encourage. Uh, that other companies are making that kind of investment to modernize their infrastructure, and we should be making that kind of investment here in this country as well. Thanks, Josh. Yeah. I'll do a couple more in the back. JC? Um, you made it very clear that the President is not directly involved in these talks, and that is the purview of the Secretary of State. What encouraging conversations has the President had, or does he look forward to having with the leaders in NATO, for example, Prime Minister Cameron, et cetera, because obviously they are part of this whole world concept as well? Uh, I don't have any specific calls to read out to you at this point, but the President and other officials in this administration are in close touch with our allies. Uh, as we work to bring both the Palestinians and the Israelis to the table, uh, as I alluded to in a previous question, I think, from Mark, uh, the world, many countries all around the world do have a pretty substantial stake in the outcome of these conversations. Uh, and this is something that the world community, and certainly with our allies and partners in the region, uh, have been working on for quite some time. Uh, and it's something that, you know, as somebody also pointed out, the previous presidents have worked on. So there is a lot of very difficult work ahead, and we're only going to be able to make progress if uh, our allies and our partners in the region are supportive of the process. And work to encourage the Israelis and Palestinians to take the necessary steps uh, to continue down this path toward peace. That's certainly what we'll be encouraging, uh, but ultimately that is, uh, that is a choice and a set of decisions that will be left up to the Israelis and Palestinians to make. And, and bringing in the, the Brits and the French at this point, mm -hmm. it, it has been going on or it, the President looks forward to that? Well, we, we, we certainly are going to rely on our allies to, con to, to support this process, and there is an important role for our allies uh, to play in, as I mentioned, sort of cajoling and encouraging and facilitating the kinds of conversations that are going to lead, uh, that will hopefully lead to some progress. Okay. Uh, Alexis, I'll give you the last one. Josh, at the Knox College speech, the President talked about something economists have talked about, is the problem of the long-term unemployed. Can you elaborate on what he had to say about hoping that uh, private sector employers would hire or look for ways to hire those individuals, whether he has an initiative in mind for that? Is there anything the federal government can do along the lines of hiring veterans to encourage that to occur? I don't want to get ahead of uh, the President's speech tomorrow, so I encourage you to tune in. But uh, if you've talked to Alan Kruger or Gene Sperling or any of the, other, any of the President's other senior economic advisors, Secretary Liu would certainly tell you this as well that one of the things that we're concerned about are those who have been unemployed for six months or longer. That we are, uh, uh, that we want to make sure that there continues to be economic opportunity and an opportunity for a job uh, for people who are in that situation. Uh, and that's something that's very difficult right now and it is a thorny uh, and a rather uh, persistent uh, problem in this country. And so we are considering uh, some initiatives that would um, try to provide some assistance to those who've been looking for a job for quite some time. Uh, but with that, I'll, uh, I'll leave it there and encourage you to tune into the President's speech tomorrow. One other quick follow-up. Sure. The President had suggested that we might see him as Congress departs mm -hmm. so he would get a chance, maybe at a news conference, to talk about this break coming up and what he expects to see in the fall. Can we expect to see him this week? Uh, I, I don't want to announce the President's schedule for the remainder of the week. Uh, but as you know, the President does uh, on occasion like to come out here and uh, talk to you a little bit about what he's been thinking about and take some questions. So uh, I don't have a date to tease out right now, but that's certainly something that the President's interested in doing. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Have a good Monday. Mr. Carney will be on the road with the President tomorrow. Have a good day, everybody.